And today, um, the first speaker will be Johannes Heiter, and he will be talking us about the volumetric analysis reveals bilateral cerebellar atrophy in Rasmussen is the palatus. <laughs> and Johannes, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction, Lai. Um, I'm gonna um, share my screen moment. So um, now you should see my presentation, right? Okay, so thanks for the um, kind introduction and thanks for joining. Um, today, I'm gonna present you, um, at least in my opinion, quite interesting and fascinating disease. Um, some of the work my colleagues and uh, me have done to get a better understanding of this condition and then finally have a discussion with you. Um, but let me start with a brief um, case presentation of a six-year-old girl who was uh, admitted to our hospital because of an uh, aggravation of epileptic seizures and um, the new onset of unilateral science of par paralysis. And then as a clinical um, follow-up uh, MRI, classic MRI was performed, um, um, shown here. And this MRI showed um, severe um, unilateral neuroinflammation and atrophy, which was restricted to one single hemisphere. And that gave the um, um, crucial hint towards the diagnosis so that the diagnosis of Rasmussen encephalitis um, could be made. And um, Rasmussen encephalitis is characterized as a um, strictly unilateral um, disease um, with progressive um, neuroinflammation as it is shown on the image on the right and um, following atrophy. But the problem on this um, disease is that um, it's not very well actually um, understand what's actually happening because there are so few cases of this um, condition. But um, in our hospital, we have um, relative, a relatively um, um, high number of Rasmussen encephalitis patients. And therefore we've performed the cortical thickness analysis comparing around 60 Rasmussen encephalitis patients with um, matched healthy controls. And the results we've got were that um, there was as expected on the ipsi lesional um, hemisphere widespread um, atrophy observable while on the contral lesional hemisphere there wasn't um, significant atrophy um, um, in our results. Um, but something we've noticed um, while looking at individual MRI scans was that uh, not only the cerebrum was affected, but there are also cases in which the cerebellum, in fact, um, seemed to be affected. It is shown here. Um, this patient, the cerebellum on the contral lesional side seems to be atrophic as well, following the um, uh, neuroanatomic connection between cerebrum and cerebellum. Um, and other cases we've seen um, follow the opposite pattern. So here, for example, you see that the ipsilesional cerebellum is affected. And to um, quantify this um, um, observation, we've performed the voxel-based morphometry um, study comparing um, Rasmussen patients and controls. And what we've seen there was that um, as expected on the uh, contral lesional um, hemisphere of the cerebellum, there was a vast amount of um, atrophy, as it is shown here on the, um, on the slide, on the image. But there was also um, some atrophy on the um, ipsi lesional side um, of the cerebellum. And um, another observation we've made was that um, also, the individual patients sometimes um, differ very closely in the um, regional um, affection of atrophy in the, within the brain. So, for example, here you can see a patient who is affected um, very much on the um, occipital side of the brain, while this patient, for example, is affected on the frontal lobe. And um, therefore, we have subdivided our patient group into um, six um, undergroups subgroups and um, um, repeated the cortical thickness analysis. And what we get was that um, was shown here. So for example, there were cases that very much a frontal um, focus of um, um, cerebral atrophy, while there were some others who had an insular one and so on. And 
question, we ask ourselves whether these different groups would also show distinct, um, distinct, distinct atrophy patterns within the cerebellum. And therefore, we um, also repeated our analysis of the cerebellum. And what we've seen there was um, mm, least, um, for example, for the frontal group, um, surprising to us. So it seems that the frontal group um, did not show um, significant atrophy on the cerebellum, while, for example, the occipital, the temporal, and the insular group show um, relevant atrophy in the cerebellum. Some of the some of them on the ipsilesional side, and um, the, for example, the um, occipital group, no, the temporal group on the contralesional side, and for example, group of diffuse um, diffuse atrophy pattern on the cerebrum did not show um, significant atrophy on the cerebellum. And um, to sum up, I would like to um, say that um, we found that um, the cerebral atrophy patterns are seeming to to be the, um, differing between different patients in um, um, in Rasmus encephalitis, and that um, depending on this subgroups, um, also the um, cerebellar atrophy pattern are quite different in um, these groups. Um, yeah, now I want to thank my uh, colleague labs, uh, my lab colleagues, <laughs> the other way around, and um, the Department of Epilepology, as well as the Institute of Experimental Epilepology and Cognition, Cognition Research in Bonn. And um, I'm looking forward to your question. Um, I think that was very fast, so I could imagine that there are some questions regarding disease or um, the presentation. Thank you very much. Great, fantastic. And then we'll maybe do this uh, knock knocking table away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, let's see if we have any questions from the QA. Anyone who's joining, feel free to ask questions. And uh, perhaps, if not, I will just start. <laughs> so okay. you mentioned one of that is um, you, you subdivided the group into six small groups, subgroups, and yeah. how, how or in which criteria you are doing this division or yeah. cl classification analysis or just some, yeah, how so, do you do that? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so um, for the first, we did it just um, kind of visually. So um, as I showed um, on this slide, there are some patients who did really show a, um, yeah, kind of um, clear atrophy pattern. So um, then we, yeah, so therefore we have uh, chosen them um, um, visually in these groups and we've chosen um, just um, all lobes as a group. And all those patients did not fit in any of the um, lobular groups uh, we put into the diffuse group. But um, of course, um, we could uh, do this classification also um, in a um, automatic um, manner. But the problem here is a little bit that um, sometimes the pathology is so severe that, um, for example, the free self analysis we did um, is difficult to, um, or at least it's difficult to um, get information um, in which exact region is atrophy because the labeling of the regions in free surfer is um, kind of um, uh, wrong because of the severe um, pathology and therefore um, yeah it's difficult to use for example the free surfer um, parcellations as um, classification cr criteria. Yeah great that's very helpful. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. Feel free to ask questions in the Q&A session mm -hmm. or also in the chat. And also let us know if you would like to show up on the stage, open your lab, webcam and uh, web camera and then to speak directly to the speakers. Okay. Maybe I have again one question. Um, did you classify the, the patients um, by atrophy on the um, affected side or the unaffected side? No, um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, so we uh, um, 
testify them um, regarding the atrophy on the um, affected side, because um, on the unaffected side, side there was not really much um, clear atrophy measurable. So um, at least not um, very significant atrophy. So um, we definitely um, classified them um, according to the atrophy on the um, ipsi lesional hemisphere. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, maybe I have a follow-up uh, question regarding still the subgroups. Ah, maybe uh, let's look at question from the Q&A first. Um, so the question from I say, and he said or she, I'm really sorry about that. So I might miss it. How was the patient's cognitive states? I mean, cerebellum has strong relation with language and working memory. So they are cognitive mm -hmm. states. Yeah, that's also an interesting question. Um, to the best, uh, what I have known is that, so this phenomenon of um, cerebellar involvement in um, when you have a um, severe um, cerebral disease is um, already known, for example, from um, traumas or from um, big tumors, and it's called cross cerebellar atrophy. But um, um, both in uh, um, our cases and in um, these studies, um, there was never a clear um, um, cognitive um, um, sign, for example, for the cerebellar um, involvement shown. So, for example, they did not show any cerebellar um, symptoms like intention tremor or anything like that. So, um, it seems like that um, it's difficult to imagine that, for example, something like that would, wouldn't have a, um, a, a clinical um, presentation. But um, until now, what I've known is that um, there, there are no clear signs um, of um, cerebellar um, symptoms. Yeah, great. That's an interesting question, yeah. an interesting answer. Yeah, yeah, great. Are there any other questions? Maybe I can start my follow-up question, <laughs> sorry. So this subgroup division uh, analysis, can that also be generalized? Let's say if there are new patients and then using the current analysis of the sample, can this result also be generalized somehow? If you maybe um, analyze the, the voxel-based uh, uh, cortical thickness, and then can you classify the new patients into one of the six, or how to do uh, yeah. respond to this kind of question? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, um, based on the the patient just need an MRI, um, a structural T1 mm -hmm. um, sequence, mm -hmm. but based on that, um, it should be po um, um, in fact possible um, to classify them them then in one of the six groups, yes. And we are currently yeah. um, into um, yeah, diving deeper in this and um, seeing okay. whether um, there are maybe clinical implications of this. Um, yeah. So for example, we have seen, as I mentioned, that um, the, that for example, the patients affected more frontally did not show um, um, atrophy in cerebellum, the group um, study, but the one, for example, um, at the insula involvement did show um, mm -hmm. atrophy. So we are currently looking into um, whether that, that could have a clinical um, meaning. So, for example, it's um, yeah. for this patient, it's very uh, very important um, to um, yeah to decide what treatment they should get because there's a um, kind of a dilemma between medical. Um, treatments like anti-epileptic drugs and um, immunosuppressive therapy and um, surgery. And the problem is that often you do not know who patients have a um, so severe um, disease that a surgery will be um, necessary. And it could be that, for example, the um, assignment to one of the groups could predict and whether uh, surgery uh, makes sense or not. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. It's very interesting. Um, there is an interesting, uh, another interesting question from the QA. And uh, Johannes, can you also see the Q&A? And if you can um, yeah. um, first read it loud and then also answer that. Okay, so control lesional cerebellar. 
Okay, so I read it now. Um, Contra lesional cerebellar atrophy can be explained by diachesis, I guess. How would you explain ipsi lesional cerebellar atrophy? Yeah, that's also um, quite interesting <laughs> question. Um, mm, the thing is, I've shown you the two examples, and um, mm, and in this case seems to be quite clear. So um, this is probably due to this phenomenon called cross cerebellar atrophy. But this isn't. But um, one suggestion is that um, primary disease affecting the cerebrum could have spread here to the cerebellum, um, so that um, yeah, Rasmus and encephalitis actually affected the cerebellum in this case. And um, some hints towards this um, suggestion suggestion is, for example, that the white matter of the um, cerebellum on the ipsilesional side um, seems to be um, also very much um, involved. So there, there's, there are hypo intensities here, and the um, cerebellum looks not very um, symmetrical and um, is quite locally affected. So therefore, one explanation could be that um, the primary disease affects the cerebellum in this case, but um, it's still not um, understood actually what, what's happening when the cerebellum in Rasmus encephalitis is on the ipsilesional side affected. Yeah, great. It's a very interesting question. Um, are there any more questions from the audience or also from Antonia as another speaker? No, she doesn't have. Maybe the last one before we move on to her talk. Um, mm -hmm. What is the current stage of this research? I'm asking because uh, do you have any follow-up analysis plans or yeah. how do you want to um, go forward, move forward? Yeah, so um, to, um, to examine what's, what's happening in the cerebellum, we, um, our plan is to um, also examine the white matter in the cerebellum and the especially also the white matter within the brain stem, because we want to look, um, want to see if there are signs, um, or is it possible to see also atrophy in the white matter indicating um, to how much extent um, cerebellar, cross cerebellar atrophy as a secondary um, atrophy is um, occurring here. And um, on the one hand, we already have performed a, um, voxel-based morphometry of the white matter. But um, one um, other thing we want to do is to look at um, DTI data of those patients. And um, we are very much interesting whether we uh, um, may be seeing their um, um, changed FA values um, in the brainstem or um, um, something which um, to, uh, hints towards uh, um, yeah, a disconnection between the contralesional cerebrum and the cerebellum. Yeah, perfect. It sounds really like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. So uh, let's thank Johannes again. And uh, I hope the discussion is useful and helpful in some way. So let's move on to the next talk. The next talk will be.